This is the MedicCast, April 25th, 2011. Transmitters? We don't need no stinking transmitters. This is the MediCast, a podcast for EMS providers by EMS providers, featuring EMS news, products, tips, tricks, and commentary. So grab your gear and glove up. Here's today's show with the pod medic, Jamie Davis. Well, good day and welcome to this week's episode of the MedicCast. I'm your host, Jamie Davis, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the program this week. There's a lot of good stuff coming up in this episode, so we won't take too long here to get into things. I just want to remind all of you to make sure you check out the MedicCast blog, where you can find links to everything discussed in this and every other web episode, as well as all sorts of articles and additional resources for providers, for students, and a whole lot more. And that can be found at MedicCast.com blog. You'll find links for show notes right at the top of the page and a whole lot of other information there. You can sign up for the email newsletter and also check out our Facebook fan page and check out the links to myself on Twitter. So you can find all of that there. If you want to get back in touch with me, you can always send me an email, podmedic at mac.com or call in on the voicemail line, 941-306-3342, 941-30-MEDIC. Let's jump on into this week's listener mail, and I have a couple of items here to check in on. First off, I heard from listener Renee, among several other folks, over on uh, the MedicCast Facebook page, over at facebook.com slash MedicCast, who were checking in to see when and where we were going to be down in Dallas for the upcoming Integrated Training Summit and Disaster Recovery and Response Expo. And that's all available um, that we're going to be down there coming up soon. You can find out more about the ITS Summit or the ITS uh, event coming up, and you can go to Integrated Training Summit org and find out all about the free resources and classes and programs that are available if you're in the Dallas area. Um, there's also, of course, hotel available and things like that. It's late late event coming up, uh, so we're going to be uh, actually there uh, starting the 2nd of May and through the end of the week. So if you're looking for um, some of the people from the ProMed Network, we're actually going to be working in the keynote area in the ballroom uh, area where they have the general sessions, we're going to be doing some live streaming for some of the federal partners at the Integrated Training Summit. Uh, But we are going to be there. Uh, I will be there midweek because I'm going to be at the Critical Care Nurses Conference in Chicago the first part of the week, doing some work for our good friends at Physio Control. But all down there for the whole week will be Chris Monterre from the EMS Garage and Carissa O'Brien from BaselineVitals.com, along with our, our best top man camera guy, Dridge. And uh, so you can see them there if you're looking, uh, if you're going to be at ITS and you want to check out the opening keynotes each day, you can see uh, the camera platform where the camera operator is and our little studio set up. And you can see Chris Montero there, Chris O'Brien, and Chris Eldridge, our camera guy. And then again, I'll be in there a little later in the week with our producer extraordinaire, Ann Robinson, as we come down from Chicago in the Critical Care Nurses Conference and show up there about Wednesday evening sometime after we fly in. And we'll be there all day Thursday and some on Friday morning. So we look forward to seeing you there. And of course, concurrently with that ITS summit is the integrated training summit is the Disaster Recovery and Response Expo, which is an exhibition for about a day and a half of some really good uh, information uh, and products and materials and vendors in the response and recovery space as far as disaster and preparedness. So check out the uh, links at integratedtrainingsummit.org and also there'll be links uh, over at the ProMed Network Dot com site. If you go to promednetwork.com, click the link for the blog there at the top of the page. There'll be a link right there on the front page to go ahead and catch some of the live streaming. If you're not going to be there and you want to catch some of the keynote addresses, it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, EMS cartoonist Steve Barry is going to be presenting the final keynote on Thursday morning, which is going to be a lot of fun. We're kind of excited that we're going to get a chance to see him there. He is just always does such a great job, and we were kind of surprised and excited to see that he was going to be presenting one of the keynote addresses. So again, you can find out more over at the ProMed Network blog, and uh, you can go there at the promednetwork.com site and click the blog link at the top of the page, or go to blog.promednetwork.com. Let's uh, check another information, uh, another email I got in. I got an email in from Rob. Rob's actually doing the podcast for emtlife.com. 
and um, he is going to be putting this podcast together for them. It's called EMT Live, I think is what he's calling it, and uh, we just love to welcome him to the EMS podcast community. And Rob, I look forward to hearing from you and hearing more shows. He's going to do about one show a month or so. And I uh, wanted to ask about how he gets the show on to the ProMed Network. And I let him know that, hey, once you got three or four shows, usually what we look for there, we'll go ahead and definitely, without a problem, post that to the ProMed Network and make that show part of the network of programs there, um, EMS, nursing, healthcare, physicians, and a whole lot more over at the ProMed Network. So we're really excited about that. And Rob, thanks for checking in and reaching out. And I'm looking forward to the next stuff that you put out there. You can find links to the podcast over at emtlife.com and a whole lot more. This isn't a paid advertisement or anything. I've been hooking up with those guys over there for years. Uh, uh, back and forth with just different little contacts here and there. So I'm really excited that we've got another EMS podcast in the community. I think there's plenty of room for all of the voices. Everybody brings a different picture and a different kind of perspective to the practice of emergency medical services and care for our patients. So I'm looking forward to hearing Rob's take on things as he progresses and continues to record more shows. And I'm looking forward to uh, finding out what you think about it as well. So check out their first episode and uh, get back to me and let me know. You can reach me here, podmedic at mac.com or call in on the voicemail line 941-306-3342. We actually had a voicemail come in and this is from a good friend of ours. Uh, You might know him from over at the, um, uh, one of our longtime listeners, he's checked in many times before, Florian and uh, Flo a.k.a. Flo from Flobach, F-L-O-B-A-C-H dot com. Uh, Flo is uh, an Australian paramedic, and he is on a bit of a world junket right now. He's going to be hitting uh, England, Scotland, I also believe Toronto, New York City, and um, San Francisco. And he just wanted to reach out and say, hey, anybody that wants to catch up with him can follow his schedule and his, where he's going to be and maybe follow him on Twitter and they can catch up and meet with him and uh, share some experiences uh, with an Australian paramedic about what your life as an EMT is like and if he's going to be in your area. And, and so just follow up with that. And um, let's just go ahead and listen to Flo's um, voicemail here as he shared some of the things he was looking forward to talking about. Hi, Jamie. It's Flo here from Perth in Western Australia. Um, I'm going on holiday in May to the UK, US, and Canada. I'd uh, love to meet up with any interested listeners to share information and exchange stories, compare EMS systems, etc. Uh, specifically, I'll be in London, Edinburgh, New York City, San Francisco, and Toronto. I've already got a few tweet-ups organized, uh, but everybody's welcome. The more, the merrier. Let me know if you and anybody else is in the area. It would be great to meet up with, uh, with many people. Uh, you can contact me via my email address, flowback at, yeah, flowback at gmail.com. That's F-L-O-B-A-C-H at gmail.com. You can also check out my blog at flowback.com, and uh, I'm on Twitter as well, at flowback. I'll uh, send you the links for that. Um, yeah, great. Keep up the show. Um, still listening after three years. Cheers. Bye. Flo, it's great to hear from you, and definitely I'll put this out on the MedicCast, and we'll share this with the listeners. And I urge you to head over and check out his schedule and follow him on Twitter. Um, of course, you can find him over on his website and blog, flobach.com, F-L-O-B-A-C-H.com. You can also follow him on Twitter, at flobach, and you can email him and get his schedule by sending him an email to flobach at gmail.com. And All of those are just great ways to catch up with a really great and a valued member of our our community here at the Beneticast and and a blogger and a producer of great content in his own right. And I always look forward to catching up with what goes on over at his blog and and his site. And I wish I had a chance to meet him myself. Uh, Just could not figure out how to get to where he was going to be with all the upcoming travel and things I have going on. But uh, hopefully I might be actually heading down to Australia maybe in the fall. Uh, crossing my fingers, if we can get a sponsor to cover a big event that's going to be heading down there, we might be heading down to Sydney. And uh, I, I know Flo's not in the Sydney area, I don't believe, but maybe we'll just have to find a way to get to where he is or meet up some way somehow. So in any case, I do want to thank him for checking in and thank him for the continued support for the show and for listening to the Nemeticast for all these years. So thanks a lot, Flo, and hopefully some of you will catch up with him. 
Time to jump into this week's news, and I'm going to pick up with a couple of stories here on my uh, screen here to uh, first off look at uh, stories having to do with ambulance transport services, specific services, and uh, reduction in services. There's three different articles here that have to do with some, th some of those things. First off, the London Ambulance Service. A lot of us maybe know about the London Ambulance Service. It's a very prestigious, uh, well thought of ambulance service, uh, transport organization, and treatment and care that provide services in London, England, and they have put out a recent report on how they're going to have to meet some of the budgetary constraints. You know, I think we think that we're the only ones here in the U.S. that face budgetary concerns when it comes to providing EMS services. But in fact, organizations all over the world are affected by the change in the healthcare picture. As a population continues to age in our industrialized countries, it is something that is going to continue to affect every nation out there as we have more and more elderly patients with more and more long-term chronic health issues, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, stroke, uh, all these things that affect older patients and that they require ongoing treatment and care for. And so there are problems all across the board. Well, the London Ambulance Service is no different. You'd think with more patients that we need more providers, but actually they're putting a strain on the system, not necessarily giving us the means by which we can go ahead and have more services to provide to them. So a lot of places are cutting back and the London Ambulance Service is no different. According to this article from the end of Enfield Independent, which is found at enfieldindependent.co.uk, um, they talk about a report that has been announced over the next five years to cut 900 jobs, both through ordinary attrition as people quit, they're not going to fill new jobs, and also through layoffs that will come out over time. And it's going to be something that we're going to see more and more frequently in a lot of different services. And, you know, just including uh, services here in the United States, we've seen that already in some places, but there's just no way to continue to provide services at the current level. So we're going to have to change not only um, the number of units we put on the street, but how we operate those units. And I think this is something that we need to really start focusing on sooner rather than later. It's almost too late already, but we need to change the way in which we operate. We can't just blindly say we're going to transport every patient that calls for an ambulance. We're going to have to change the public's expectation for what happens when they call 911. Are we going to have them expect to just automatically have an ambulance show up? Or are we going to send a chase car or do some more triage via the telephone, maybe hooking up with a call-in nurse service or something like that, where we can hook them up with the hospital so that they don't have to go to the ER, or they can we can hook, hook them up with local 24-hour clinics, with urgent care centers, with their primary care physician if they have one. All of these things are going to just have to change the way in which we operate, and we just can't keep blindly going down the path as if nothing's going to change, because Evidence like this from the London Ambulance Service and many other places around the world say that we are going to have to change the way we operate in order to provide care for the patients that really need emergency transport and care. And we're not going to be able to tie ourselves up, taking every hangnail and bloody nose to the hospital. So I, I hope that we are thinking outside of the box and how we're going to approach this because uh, I've just seen too many times that when we can't meet the services that the public expects of us, that EMS all too often gets thrown under the bus and somehow we failed to do our duty when in fact it was the system that has failed to adequately provide services at the level at which the public expects them. And uh, we're not at fault. It, it's the way the system is set up. And I think that that needs to be addressed very carefully. Next up on the articles here in the news, um, an interesting article I found on, out of Memphis, Tennessee, talking about new, a new bariatric unit. And uh, this is interesting. You know, I've seen these more and more in the news as uh, I do my searches from week to week. And I wanted to point out that one of the things we're going to need to change is how we handle certain types of calls. You know, uh, we cannot just continue to transport severely obese patients on our regular equipment with just two crew members and very little help to get them on and off the stretcher. 
Um, lower back injuries are one of the most common causes of disability in the healthcare environment, and EMS is no stranger to that. However, because EMS falls kind of outside of the normal healthcare circles, we don't get the scrutiny from OSHA that the nursing home environment, the hospital environment, and the physician's office environment gets when they look at claims for back injuries from workers. So what do we do to fix that? Well, we have bariatric units, specifically designed units with specifically designed equipment to transport and mobilize patients of extreme size. Um, and one of the things that we need to uh, think about is how that's going to uh, affect the policies and procedures we have in place. So great, Memphis, Tennessee has a new bariatric unit. Well, who gets to use it? How do you activate that unit? How do you call for it? How long do you let a patient wait for it? Or is there a procedure and policy in place that says if you have a critically ill patient who weighs 700 pounds and it's just you and your partner, you cannot be expected to carry that patient and get them out into your ambulance. No way, no how. You need the proper equipment and assistance to do it effectively. That you're not gonna put your future career, your life, and your, your ability to work in the workforce productively in danger just because this patient's critically ill and weighs too much to safely carry for two people. Heck, he weighs too much to safely carry for eight people. It is just something we need to really keep in mind. So I want to let you focus on this and think about, all right, what resources do you have? If you have a severely obese patient, do you have a bariatric unit? Have you reviewed the policies and procedures on how you call for that unit, activate that unit, and when is it available? Is it available 24 seven or is it get locked up at the main office after normal office hours and so you don't get to use it in the middle of the night? Um, there's a lot of different things that come into play here and I just wanted you to kind of think outside of, of the box again on how you would provide services to a community when you don't necessarily have the resources you need to do it the way you've always been doing it. And uh, this is another example. Coming up finally in the news is a final example of similar things. Not just morbidly obese patients, but also other patient populations that have special needs, like neonatal transportation units. And neonatal uh, intensive care units are uh, units that are, are seen frequently in areas that have children's hospitals, but there are a lot of regions that need some kind of advanced neonatal transport service and in rural areas where they have long transport times especially. So it was interesting to see that Southern Saskatchewan, I'm gonna say this right, Southern Saskatchewan in Canada is adding, thanks to a corporate donation, a $350,000 neonatal intensive care transport unit that will be utilized to provide these specialized transport services in the southern end of that province. And I think it's, again, something you need to kind of review. What kind of units are available out there? Can you access those special resources directly through your normal dispatch circles? Are they tied to another service? You know, a lot of areas in the United States have a private service, third party, providing public ambulance service in the community, but these NICU units may be tied to a hospital system. And will your business allow you to call another business to transport a patient when you may not have the resources necessary to do so effectively and safely? Um, that's a question that I bet your bosses don't want you to ask, but it's something that we need to keep in mind. You know, when we do our testing in EMT and paramedic and we think about that scene size up, that, that initial steps when we look at what we have and what do we need, additional resources include, do I need a bariatric unit? Do I need a NICU unit? Do I need additional ambulances for mass casualties? So on and so on and so on. Those are all things that need to be addressed, and we need to keep these things in mind as new and more diverse resources for specialized patient populations come into play in our regions. You know, I look forward to your comments on this. Maybe you have policies and procedures in place in your organization. Heck, send them to me. I'd love to take a look at them and see what different places around the country are doing. Hey, if it's top secret, don't send it to me. Don't get yourself in trouble. I'm not going to publish them or anything, but I always love to look and see what kind of policies and things people have out there. In the meantime, I do want to ask you to comment back. Let me know what you think of the article. Go ahead and shoot me an email to podmedic at mac.com or go ahead and call in on the voicemail line like Flo did and call in 941-306-3342, 941 
30 medic. Just put that number in your cell phone and go ahead and call me when you get a chance and share your thoughts about these news items and what you might be doing for uh, the upcoming crisis for transportation and uh, healthcare funding in your community. Maybe your agency is cutting back. Uh, how are you going to address getting tr dealing with the same number of patient calls with fewer ambulance services? Or how are you going to deal with per patient populations like the morbidly obese or the neonatal transport population? Love to hear from you. And I will look forward to getting those emails soon. Let's jump on into this week's tip of the week, and we're going to go ahead and get started with uh, kind of jumping back to basics. I got an email from a couple of different people asking me to think about going and looking at some of the things we need to review all the time. And I'm a big proponent of carrying around your protocols and, you know, keeping them, hey, I, you know, keep the protocols, I always say, on the back of the toilet so you can read them when you have some time to uh, quickly read and review items and short bits of information. But it's important to review those basic things, things that you haven't maybe thought about in a sense of testing for a long time. So it's important for existing EMTs, paramedics to review the basics and it's also of course important for students to have ways to review those pieces of information they're going to need to test on. And uh, so we're going to go back and do something we haven't done in a while, which is go back and revisit some of the basic and advanced skill stations from the National Registry test. Now, I want to urge you to head over and check out the information that's available over at the National Registry website, nremt.org, and you'll find a lot of great information over there including links to all the skill sheets. So you can download these, download these PDF files and make them uh, useful for you, whether it's for review for an existing paramedic or EMT, or if you're using them to study if you're a student, definitely you want to make sure you avail yourself of the information and resources that are available over there. It'll teach you a lot about what to expect from your testing environment, both in the computer-based test and the you know, so-called written test, and then also, of course, in the skill stations. But let's go ahead and start off. We're going to just talk about the basic and advanced airway management and airway skills stations that are used in both the National Registry BLS testing process and skills and also in the ALS testing for skills. And we'll start off with just some information on how to prepare and do some things with that. In the BLS sector, we're talking about the oxygen administration, mouth to mask, um, administration with an oxygen attached, uh, airway adjuncts and suction, and use of a bag valve mask for an apneic patient. In the ALS side, we're talking about adult ventilatory management, uh, use of an endotracheal tube along with bag valve mask. Uh, also, use of a dual lumen airway. Uh, this would be, in many cases, uh, either the combi tube, the king airway, um, also uh, the easy tube. There's lots of things out there that are being used in this under this uh, under the auspices of this section, but you do need to test for this in most of the ALS testing stations, uh, so you'll need to do that. And also pediatric ventilatory management, which includes the use of endotracheal tubes for pediatric patients. We're going to be using in this particular skill segment the 2010 ECC guidelines, the Emergency Cardiovascular Care Guidelines from the American Heart Association. And uh, so I'm going to be following the airway management ventilatory rates that are published there. They may be different from what you get in your particular station. So, you know, download these skill sheets and the test manual from the National Registry website and follow the information there. But also, most importantly, if there's a conflict between what I say and what your instructor or your testing site says or what your state protocols say to do, follow the testing protocols under which you'll be testing. Follow your instructor's guidelines. They know what your testing environment is going to be like. I'm using the ECC guideline updates because I suspect that over the next few months those will be rolled into these documents, so we want to try to be as current as possible, but when you're referring to the documents or referring to what your resources are given to you in your instructor environment, you definitely want to be following the things you're getting from your instructor and be very careful with how you do that. Now, also you want to think about how you're going to prepare for this. How are you going to prepare to test in this environment? There's really no substitute for 
practicing. And I mean hands on, get your feet, fingers dirty, get in there and practice, practice, practice with the equipment. Get with your buddies, set up study groups, find out how you can get access to the mannequins after hours and at different times and practice, practice, practice. Of course, this requires memorization and repetition, and that's all a key part of learning anything new and being able to apply that effectively. You have to have at least some of the steps or all of the steps memorized, and you need to repeat that information in your brain out loud and through practice over and over again to make it stick and to make yourself proficient and competent with these skills. I mean, that's what these skills tests are for. It's, yeah, it's to test and make sure you learn stuff, but it's to make sure you're competent and proficient to provide care at some minimum safe level so when you get out there in the field, you don't kill somebody because you didn't know how to do something you should have known how to do. So that's what this process is for. One of the things that I don't think we do very often in the testing situation in the educational environment is think about the process of visualization and how that works with any type of psychomotor skill, any type of reproducible process you're going to do using your mind and your muscles. And one of the things that I think we miss out on is what some, something that athletes and researchers in the athletic environment have known for a long time. Visualizing yourself doing certain skills makes a difference and improves your performance when it comes time to actually do that skill. So yeah, there's no substitute for practicing and getting your hands on it, but when you can't get your hands on the mannequins, visualize yourself going through the process from start to finish, either using one of these skill sheets or going ahead and just visualizing it, close your eyes, think about, hey, all right, I'm, this is how I'm gonna go through the intubation process and think it through step by step all the way through, seeing yourself doing it successfully correctly every time. That cements that memory even more firmly so that you're able to do the skill better. And this is something, like I said, athletes have known for a long time, but I think the educational environment, especially in our setting where we're using our hands to do certain specific things, can, we can use it as well. So use that skill when you can't get your hands on the mannequins. Make sure you have the skill sheets in hand and make sure you have study partners. You need to do this in groups. Um, one or two people, two people at the very least, sometimes even larger groups. Put scenarios together, assign everybody the, the duty to come back to the next class where you're gonna practice and bring two scenarios for each skill station with them so that everybody gets to see something a little different. And then get your study partners to sit down and take turns using the skill sheets and checking each other off as you do the skills. Did you pass or fail? See what the preceptor is looking for. It'll make it easier for you to pass the test by being the preceptor on the side. If you can teach somebody to do something, if you can overview and watch something and see what's right or wrong, you will be better at performing that skill too. So one final thing about testing. There's just some things, common sense things maybe, but things that you can do to improve your ability to take any kind of test, whether it's a written test, a computer test, or a skills test. And they start off with just the basics, rest, relax, and food. You need to be able to make sure you're rested as possible. I know we get jittery, I know we don't feel like we can sleep, but this is not the night to go out partying with your pals and staying up till all hours if you've gotta be in doing your skills test at eight o'clock the next morning. So make sure you've got an opportunity to have enough rest and relaxation. Don't try to cram the night before. You know, if you don't know it by 12 hours before the test, you're not gonna know it. I don't care how much you study. So just, this is the time to let your brain rest and percolate. Watch a funny movie, get your mind off the test, it'll help you relax, it'll help you fall asleep easier, and go ahead and be ready for the test the next day. One of the other things is, save yourself from the aggravation of missing the stupid stuff, like forgetting to say BSI or scene safety when you walk in the room, right? So how can you do that? Well, one of the things that was taught to me that I thought was a great idea, and it's something I did when I tested, is I put gloves on first thing in the morning before I walked into the first station, and I left my gloves on, yes, yeah, sweaty palms and all, for the rest of the morning while I went through the skills test. This is a great way to take your mind away from having to worry about whether you say scene safety or BSI. Now you should still try to remember to say it, but if perhaps you forget to say it, and guess what, I did, okay? I forgot to say it, but I had gloves on. Someone had told me to do this, I had gloves on. And interestingly enough, the skill sheets say something very clear, takes or verbalizes body substance isolation precautions. Are you wearing gloves? 
you took body substance isolation precautions. So therefore, you don't have to verbalize it necessarily. Now, I would verbalize it anyway, because you can always have that preceptor that may not read that the same way I do. But I had a preceptor that looked at it and goes, I guess you were thinking about BSI, you have your gloves on. So they gave me the benefit of the doubt. And this will just be one other thing that'll save you. You're gonna check your equipment. One of the things you get to do at every skill station is look over the equipment that you have available to you. Now this is in normal situations. You'll be allowed to make sure that everything is in good working order and that you're familiar with the standard operation and use of the equipment that is there. If you're testing in a skill, testing in a place that is not where you learn to do a skill, um, they may have something different for longboard um, longboard clips. They might have speed clips. They might have nine foot straps. Some places use duct tape. So in order to make sure that you have the right stuff, there, there is the opportunity, especially in the airway stations, to look over the equipment and make sure you understand and recognize it. Perhaps there is a type of regulator valve that is very, very different from what you're used to seeing. Now, they're all pretty much the same, but maybe it's something that's just completely out of whack and you just need to say, all right, wait a minute. Where's the, where's the place you set the liters per minute on this because I don't see the dial? You know, that's a specific question you can ask and they can demonstrate this is how you do it. You knew you needed to do that part of the skill, but you didn't know this regulator and maybe there's a funny way to do that. Maybe there's a notch dial underneath that you didn't see. So you're used to something with a big knob on the outside and they had something that was a little bit different. You get to check those things. The other advantage to this is maybe depending on what you're doing, you might get a chance to a little bit, do a little bit of prearrangement of your materials when you go to take the test. And by that I mean you might get the opportunity to get the equipment laid out in the order in which you might be ready to use it when the time comes. Now this is something you have to think about ahead of time and think about what you want to do. But if you know that airway mannequin always uses the same sized or a pharyngeal airway, when you go to check to make sure the OPAs are there, just put that one in the top, in, when you put them all back in the box, put that one first. Okay, close the lid, now you know where it is. No fumbling for it, you still have to measure it, you still have to demonstrate you know how to do the skill, but you get to go ahead and um, avoid just a little more hassle by, because you couldn't find something you were expecting to see. So use that opportunity to check your equipment. Take a deep breath. What? Yeah, take a deep breath. It seems simple, it maybe seems stupid to some of you, but I'm going to tell you something. If you can put your mind and body at ease and ratchet down your anxiety level even a little bit by doing something as simple as then you can go a long way towards being a little more relaxed, a little more confident, and being able to pass those skills tests a lot easier. And so one of the things you're going to want to do is make sure you take a deep breath before you get started in each skill station. Remember this, think it, write it on the back of your hand, I don't care, but make sure it's there in the forefront of your brain and take that deep breath. You're going to be amazed at how much this makes a huge difference when you go to test. And then just start your test. By doing these things to get started, by, by studying properly, by preparing yourself correctly, and by going ahead and getting ready right in the test environment properly, you can improve your ability to do well on the test stations when the time comes. So let's get into the National Registry BLS Airway Skills Station. We're gonna start off with the first one here, which is oxygen administration. Now just so you know, in your particular testing environment, they may take several of these skill stations and combine them. The, the skills here are pretty straightforward and easy. And for instance, you're going to be using oxygen in the mouth-to-mask -mouth station and scenario. You're going to be using oxygen in the bag mask scenario. You're going to be using oxygen in a lot of these scenarios. So there may, they may take the oxygen administration station and combine it with some of the other stations. So don't worry about it, but know what you need to do to set up and apply oxygen safely to a patient with the non-rebreather mask and the nasal cannula. Let's go through those steps right now and talk about it. First off, don't forget scene safety BSI. First off, you're going to go ahead and assemble the regulator to the oxygen tank. Do this carefully, be thorough, and make sure you assemble it correctly without any leaks. You're going to open the valve and verify that there are no leaks. Check for leaks. Look, listen, um, check for leaks. Check the tank pressure. You need to know where that is. You need to verify that, yes, there is enough 
pressure in this tank. You may have a tank that has no pressure. That may be a test to see if you're actually checking it and you're going to say, this is in the red. There's not enough pressure in this tank to safely deliver oxygen to a patient. And they'll say, okay, we don't have another tank here, but you verified that you did check it. The tank is now full. You can go ahead and proceed. So just be aware that you're doing that. Go ahead and attach your non-rebreather mask to oxygen and fill the reservoir bag. So go ahead and put your fingers in there, close the little flapper valve, and let the reservoir bag pre-fill. Adjust your liter flow uh, prior to this to at least 12 liters per minute. And then when the liter, when the pre reservoir bag is pre-filled, go ahead and apply it to your patient correctly. Fitting it, making sure the straps are put appropriately, not too tight, but that it's hold, held snugly to the face. At this point, the preceptor is going to say to you, hey, you're going to go ahead and um, need to make sure that the uh, patient is not able to tolerate this. So medical control wants you to switch them out and put a nasal cannula on them. So you're going to go ahead and you're going to get that mask off of the patient and switch the nasal cannula, attaching it to the oxygen, going ahead and adjusting the flow rate to no more than six liters per minute. So just set it to six and leave it there. Make sure it's set pro properly. Apply the nasal cannula correctly to the patient, adjust it so that it fits snugly, not too tight, and that it is fit fitted properly for the patient. At this point, you will be told that medical control has advised you to discontinue oxygen therapy. So you'll remove the nasal cannula from the patient, shut off the regulator, and you're going to go ahead and relieve the pressure in the regulator valve. Once you've done that, you've completed this station for the National Registry BLS skills test. And uh, those are things you're going to do. Now, there are always critical criteria so that you might miss one or two things in there and still pass. But if you fail any of the critical criteria, it's an automatic fail. You did not take verbalize or wear body substance isolation precautions. You did not assemble the tank and regulator correctly without leaks in the allotted time frame. You did not pre-fill the reservoir bag. You did not adjust the device to the correct liter flow for the non-rebreather mask, and that would be 12 liters per minute or greater. And you didn't adjust the correct liter flow for the nasal cannula, six liters per minute or less. So make sure you're applying the correct liter flow for these devices. And that's the oxygen administration station for the National Registry. Now you might also have the mouth to mask with oxygen station, and again, we're going to start that off with applying correctly BSI. So make sure you say scene safety and BSI when you get there. Go ahead and connect the a mask correctly. You're going to pop the mask open. If it's one of those fold up masks, you're going to uh, correctly apply the one way valve to the mask. The mask should have an oxygen inlet on the side as well. Um, you're going to correctly open the patient's airway. You can do this either manually with a head tilt chin lift or and or you may also use a, an adjunct, either a nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal airway. Using it correctly, measuring it correctly. Um, remember oropharyngeal airways measure from the corner of the mouth to the ear and the oropharyngeal airways measure from the side of the nose, the nares, to the earlobe as well. And so that's how you would measure these devices. You want to go ahead and uh, establish and maintain a correct seal with the mask using an EC clamp technique with your hands, and then you will properly um, uh, ventilate the patient. Now, we're going to say at 10 breaths per minute, which will be once every six seconds. You can now connect the oxygen to the mask and continue ventilating the patient. Um, at the correct rate after you've set the flow rate to at least 15 liters per minute. Um, again, ventilating these patients at 10 breaths per minute, which is six every six seconds. Now you can connect the oxygen at other points in the process. So if you want to connect the oxygen immediately and turn it on as you apply the mask, you can do that. But you must make sure that you are getting the mask applied and begin ventilating the patient quickly in the process. Critical criteria to keep in mind here before we move on. Uh, you want to make sure that you don't forget to do BSI. You want to make sure that you adjust your oxygen rate to at least 15 liters per minute. You want to make sure that you gave enough volume per breath when you were ventilating the patient. You get only two ventilation errors 
in the uh, per minute when you're ventilating these patients. So make sure you got a good seal. And how much do you give the patient? You give them enough oxygen or enough air flow ventilation to cause the chest to rise on the mannequin. Uh, so you want to see the chest rise. If you're using just a head mannequin, you want to see those lungs inflate. So whatever the case may be, you want to make sure you're giving enough oxygen or giving enough airflow. If you don't ventilate the patient at the correct rate of 10 to 12 breaths per minute, and if you don't allow the patient to completely exhale before you give the next breath. So you need to make sure you give the patient enough time to get the old air out so you can put the new air in. All of that is part of the process in the mouth to mask with supplemental oxygen station. Uh, next up, we have the airway oxygen ventilation skills, including upper airway adjunct and suction. So let's go ahead and check that station out. Now, first off, of course, you're going to start off with BSI, maintaining body substance isolation. You're going to have an airway mannequin or a patient there. You're going to correctly size and measure an oropharyngeal airway by measuring from the corner of the mouth to the tip of the earlobe. You'll go ahead and insert the airway properly according to these instructions without pushing the tongue posteriorly. What does that mean? Well, current Currently, at least in my area, we're supposed to be using a tongue blade, a tongue depressor, to depress the tongue and then curving, insert the blade over the tongue. When I learned it, we stuck it in upside down and then twisted it, turned it around 180 degrees so that the curve was now down over the back of the tongue. Whatever your instructors told you to do, do. If you're an existing provider, you should know what the current practice is in your region. If you don't, it's time to ask that training officer, hey, you know, I learned it this way. Are we still doing it that way? There's nothing wrong with asking that question. You'll go ahead and the, at, the, at the point that you get the airway inserted correctly and you've removed the tongue blade, um, you're going to be told that the patient is gagging and starting to become conscious. So what do you do there? You remove the airway from this patient. At this point, you're going to go ahead and turn on your suction device. The examiner is going to tell you that you need to suction the patient's airway. They're making gurgling sounds. You're going to turn on your suction device, get it prepared, make sure that it's appropriately set up. So if you're using a Yankauer tip, make sure you've actually got suction at the distal end of the tip. Um, once you do that and you've verified you have suction, go ahead and you're going to insert the tip to the point in the back of the oropharynx so you can visualize, still visualize the distal end of the tip. We never blind suction in this particular setup. You insert it without suction applied and then you apply suction to the back of the oropharynx after you've already applied, uh, inserted the device in there. You apply suction for less than 15 seconds and then remove. Now, at this point, you will be advised that it's time to insert a nasopharyngeal airway. So you'll go ahead and insert a nasopharyngeal airway by, first off, selecting and measuring the correct nasopharyngeal airway for the patient. Now, one of the things you can do is look at the size of the, the nares, uh, how big is the opening. That's one way. Uh, you might look at the patient's pinky, but ultimately, you need one that's long enough to reach all the way to the back of the nasopharynx. So you need to measure from the nares to the corner of the earlobe to correctly find it. You're going to lubricate it. This is usually a verbal statement in most settings. They don't want you gooping up the mannequins. So you're going to go ahead and put uh, lubricate, uh, verbalize that you're lubricating the nasopharyngeal airway. And then you're going to insert the nasopharyngeal airway correctly with the bevel towards the septum, um, advancing it slowly until it is fully inserted in the nares. Now, there are some critical criteria here as well. If you did not take or use body substance isolation, we already talked about that. If you don't obtain a patent airway with an oropharyngeal airway, in other words, you stuck it in wrong, you rolled the tongue back, whatever the case may be, you were not able to correctly insert the OPA. You didn't get a patent airway with the nasopharyngeal airway. Again, is there some reason you weren't able to get it inserted properly? Did you not measure it correctly? Um, if you put a device that was too small in there, it's not going to reach all the way to the back and you'll be, you'll be dinged on that. So you've got to make sure you're doing your measurements. If you didn't appropriately demonstrate acceptable suctioning techniques, did you just jam that thing in there without visualizing where the distal end was? You've got to be able to see where the distal end of that device is at all times. Also, if you inserted any of the adjuncts in a manner dangerous to the patient, you would be failed on this particular skill station. 
Finally, for the BLS stations, we have the bag valve mask for an apneic patient station. Now, um, this one is basically going to be uh, testing your ability to get a seal with a bag mask as one individual, um, also using air, airway adjuncts. So these could be combined with other stations, so be aware of that. Of course, we start off with BSI. We're then going to open the airway with a head tilt chin lift, and we're going to insert an adjunct. In some cases, this may be a verbal statement that I'm going to be using an oropharyngeal airway. I measure it correctly using the measurement technique of measuring from the corner of the mouth to the tip of the earlobe, or nasopharyngeal airway by measuring from the tip of the nares nar the nar to the tip of the earlobe, whatever the case may be, you might verbalize this. You're going to select the correct bag valve mask. Now, they might trick you and have a PD mask set on the end of this bag and wonder if you're going to pick up the correct bag or not. So make sure you select the correct bag for the patient you have. If you're not sure if this is a young adult patient or an adult patient, say to them, I'm assuming this is an adult patient. I'm going to select the adult bag valve mask. Um, so be aware of that and don't fall prey to some kind of trick trickery. Um, ask the question and state what your observations are and what your assumptions are. If you're wrong, they'll tell you. You want to then correctly create a seal with the mask and begin ventilating the patient. Now you have to ventilate the patient and the examiner is going to watch you do that for at least 30 seconds. Um, during this time frame, again, we're going to ventilate these patients at a rate of about 10 breaths per minute. That's about once every six seconds. You're going to go ahead and ventilate the patient. You will now connect oxygen to the reservoir and set the flow rate to 15 liters per minute. Now, this has got a little asterisk next to it on the skill sheet because if you have got your ducks in a row, there's no reason you can't quickly hook the oxygen tank up to the bag mask as you're getting ready to apply it to the patient. But you need to do so quickly. Make sure you turn the oxygen on, set the flow rate correctly, verbalize all the steps while you do it, and then go ahead and begin bagging the patient. And you have to do that in less than 15 seconds. You need to get the bag mask on the patient quickly and efficiently. So if you have not yet attached the oxygen, now's the time to do it. You'll go ahead and bag the patient again at the correct oxygen flow rate at 15 liters per minute. You're going to go ahead and a second provider will come in and you're going to correctly show how to do a two-person bag mask technique with one person providing a double EC clamp with the mask to get a good seal on the patient while another person bags the patient. And you're going to instruct them to bag correctly and how often and how much to ventilate the patient. So you're going to be watching for chest rise, you're going to be watching for the lung inflation on those head mannequins, and you're going to go ahead and instruct them to bag every six to eight seconds. Now, you will now be uh, instructed to go ahead and uh, ventilate the patient. You're going to open the airway, recreate a seal when you, when you do this two-handed technique, do all those processes again to make sure you're getting a good seal and that the airway is nice and open. And then you're going to instruct the assistant, which is usually the preceptor in these things, instruct them how to correctly ventilate with the bag, watching for chest rise and ve ventilating at the proper rate for at least 30 seconds, they're going to test that. Now, you're going to go ahead and do these things. There are some critical criteria. Again, failure to observe BSI is one of them. If you don't immediately ventilate the patient, so you need to get ventilating that patient within 15 seconds or so of getting started in the station. When you say, I'm ready to begin, and he says, start, you've got that much time to get the bag selected, picked up, Get the head tilt chin lift in place, verbalize you're going to be putting on an NPA or OPA or actually put one in quickly and then get the bag on the patient. Um, so depending on what equipment is there, you're not going to necessarily be able to get the oxygen hooked up right away. You also need to make sure that you don't interrupt ventilations for longer than 20 seconds at any point. So if you do stop to attach oxygen, remember you need to get it back on in 20 seconds. So keep an eye on the time. Hold your breath. Some people say hold your breath. When you start feeling like you're running out of air, guess what? The patient is too. Uh, that's a good way to do it. Don't, if you don't provide enough oxygen content, so you need to have at least 15 liters per minute of flow to get the correct oxygen level for a bag valve mask. If you didn't provide or if you failed to provide direction to your assistant to give the proper ventilation volume or rate, you will have failed this station. And if you don't allow for the patient to have enough time to exhale correctly at the end of each breath, that also is a fail point. 
Now, again, I say eight to 10 seconds according to the current ECC guidelines. You may have different guidelines for you to follow, but I'm looking at eight to 10 breaths per second for an apneic patient, especially when they're on 100% oxygen. You need to follow whatever your instructor guidelines say in these particular stations. And this is how you go through and do these basic BLS skills and prepare for the National Registry test in those stations. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode of the MedicCast. I want to thank everybody for checking out the show this week. Remind all of you to head over and check out the information and links from the tip this week, from the episode news and everything else over at the MedicCast blog. You can find that at MedicCast.com slash blog. And I urge you to head over there. There's a link for the show notes right at the top of the page. Click that link and you can find the most recent episode listed first. And if you need to find a previous episode, scroll back and find those older episodes. And you can follow up on the news links. And of course, I always provide additional resource tips and links for you in the show notes for every episode because I can present a quick overview of some tip or something here, but I want you to have the resources you need to go and find in-depth information so that you can back up and see how it applies directly to your own practice, scope of use, and protocols so that you can make sure that you are operating safely and correctly within the guidelines that are available to you. Now, you can also always get back in touch with me. I love to hear from you. If you'd like to reach me by email, send those emails into podmedic at mac.com. You can also always call in on the voicemail line, 941-306-3342, 941-30-MEDIC. And I love to hear from you. Don't forget, you can always become a fan over at the Facebook fan page for the MedicCast. That's facebook.com slash MedicCast. And you can find me directly over on Facebook and Twitter under the handle PodMedic. Facebook.com slash PodMedic and Twitter.com slash PodMedic. That's it. We're going to go ahead and close out the show as we always do with some good pod safe music. This is Henry and the, the Invisibles again. Uh, I've been playing his music a lot. I found him, discovered him down in um, South by Southwest in Austin this past year and just got a lot of great music. I asked him if I could have permission to play his songs here on the show and give him some credit. So head over to henryinvisibles.com. You can find a link in the show notes. And uh, this is his song, Up and Over. Just a peppy little funk song. So if you like what you hear, check it out and you can let Henry know you heard it here on the MedicCast. That's it. I'm Jamie Davis, the Pod Medic. I'll be back again soon with another episode. In the meantime, please remember to stay safe and remember scene safety and BSI.